Hey, good evening, gang. Mark Boswell, Boswell Merchant Medical Education Technology here. Hey, another little video short to discuss the most recent practice CEN question. And I'm going to discuss practice question number 882. 882. Hey, guess what happens? 18 more questions. I've got another book coming out. Awesome. So let me read the question first. And this was posted uh, two days ago. The question is, the assessment of a trauma patient reveals the following. Distended neck veins, hypotension, and muffled heart sounds. Based on these findings, the expected intervention is which of the following? So to pick your answer for this question, uh, the four choices are A, chest tube insertion at the fifth intercostal space. B, insertion of a 14-gauge needle at the second intercostal space, midclavicular line. C, prepare for an incision to the left of the xiphoid process. And D, give IV fluids at a controlled rate. All right. So, I'm going to give you the correct answer first, and we'll talk about the other three, why they're wrong. The correct answer is, prepare for C, to prepare for incision to the left of the, inner of the xiphoid process. So, why is it the right answer? Well, let's look at the stem of the question. So, the patient has distended neck veins, hypotension, and muffled heart sounds. Guys, on the CEN exam, muffled or dampened heart sounds are always a dead giveaway for cardiac tamponade. Okay, so even just on that one finding alone, if that's all I told you, think about cardiac tamponade. The other things go with it too. The hypotension, because cardiac tamponade is an obstructive type of shock. The distended neck veins, because as the heart pericardial sac is filling with fluid, the jugulars can't drain down. So you get the JVD also. So this patient is having what we call Beck's triad, and you need to know this for the exam. Okay, I've seen it many times in the exam. It's taught. Frequently is talked about frequently, Beck's triad, hypotension, JVD, muffled heart sound, or dampened, okay? How do, you relieve a, how do you relieve a cardiac tamponade? You either do an emergency pericardiocentesis, where a lot of your ER providers will do this under guided ultrasound, and they'll go with a needle, uh, sub space towards the right shoulder, and aspirating the blood out. This is usually a trauma presentation. If the patient's somewhat stable, then they're going to take them to the OR and make an incision and do a pericardial window, okay? That would be the incision just to the left of the of the um, xiphoid process. Let's look at why the other answers are not correct. So answer B, and I'm, I'm looking at my other screen here so I can read the answers to you. Uh, answer B says insertion of a 14-gauge needle, second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. What is that the treatment for? That is a treatment for a tension pneumothorax. What are the symptoms of a tension pneumothorax? We have either absent or markedly decreased lung sounds on the affected side, hint, probably the same side with the open chest wound also. Ding, 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 that's a big giveaway. We may have JVD with that also, and probably hypotension because a tension pneumothorax is also an obstructive case of shock. Remember, our definitions of shock relate to where the problem is. A tension pneumothorax it's not a problem with a collapsed lung. It's a problem with the air pressure compressing the mediastinum and shutting off the blood flow. So we relieve the obstruction. However, this question is not discussing that or explaining that. This question is actually describing cardiac tamponade. But the 14-gauge needle at the second or third intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, is a treatment for attention to thorax. That is one of your life and death emergencies you treat right away. So that's not the right answer here. Um, chest tube insertion at the fifth intercostal space, choice A. That is your treatment for a hemothorax. And that is not something we do during the primary survey because it's not an immediate life threat, okay? During the primary survey, we only, do, we only stop and don't pass go for immediate life threats. And those are things that immediately compromise our circulation or our pulmonary perfusion, uh, things that you will die from basically in, 60 seconds or less. So a hemothorax is something we can deal with in the secondary survey, um, and that would be the fifth intercostal space with a chest tube. Answer D was give IV fluids at a controlled rate, titrate to a systolic blood pressure. So what is that the treatment for? That is a treatment for most of our cardiogenic shocks. In other words, a type of shock where the heart muscle is actually damaged and cannot generate enough cardiac output what we don't want to do in that patient who may be hypotensive 
is overload them with fluids because overloading their fluids increases their preload. I'll discuss that tomorrow. Increases their preload and makes their cardiac output worse. So the cause of cardiogenic shock are massive CHF with the pulmonary edema, multiple zone infarcts, multiple zone acute MIs, and also our right side, uh, our right side MI or our right ventricular MI. Okay. So the right answer here was to get ready to do an incision, the fourth, inter um, I'm sorry, incision just left of the xiphoid process, doing that pericardial window to relieve the cardiac tamponade. And Beck's triad is something you need to know for this test. I can't, and I can't stress that enough. Hypotension, JVD, muffled heart sounds. Okay. So that's kind of like your little cardiac tamponade mini lecture in about five minutes. All right. Hope that helps the explanation. Um, the question, the original question and the rationale are also posted on the Facebook page there just now. Um, I also want to address a little question I had also someone put with the original question about the location for needle decompression retention pneumo. So remember the BCN always follows whatever the TNCC or the EMPC says. Now in the seventh edition of the TNCC, they were saying consider the fourth or fifth mid axillary line for needle decompression. They said consider. The standard, the baseline default was still the second or third intercostal space, midclavicular. With the eighth edition, they've now gone back to that. So we're still advocating for the second or third intercostal space, midclavicular line. The whole thing that makes this unique is it needs to be a long enough needle. It needs to be a three and a quarter or more. I'm going to show you mine. Hang on. I got it right over here. Well, no, I can't. Sorry. Yes, I do. Hold on. The big thing with a lot of these needles was they were not long enough that a third of the time your regular 14 gauge trauma needle was not long enough to get into the pleural space. Okay. So the current recommendation, the main thing is 14 gauge or bigger and three and a quarter inches long. At three and a quarter inches long, this will enter the interpleural space 100% of the time at that second or third intercostal space. Okay, uh, this is actually a 10 gauge. Look at the size of that. All right, so it's, the answer is 14 gauge or bigger. All right, interesting thing about this needle, and this one's actually designed for needle decompression. Because this bo the bore, the diameter of this needle is so huge, it's a 10 gauge, they actually recommend that as you find your landmark, you actually use the bevel. I'm trying to put it from the camera here. Hang on, there we go. Where's the bevel? There you go. Actually use the bevel because it's razor sharp and make actually a small incision just above the insertion site. That way you're not risking getting a plug inside there of skin and fat and soft tissue as you go through. Okay. So actually making like a little cut using the bevel there. So 14, 14 gauge or larger. Three and a quarter inch is the minimum recommendation to reach the adequate depth. And this is actually sold. Um, I have I have no interest in this business, but North American Rescue actually makes this. It's a dedicated needle decompression. It comes in a rigid sharps from the container. So if you use it, you can put it back in there or to dispose of it. Um, I actually carry this in my travel bag. So when I'm flying or traveling across the U.S. going to classes, I've actually got one with me. Uh, definitely large enough. I will talk more about needle decompression in a following lecture, but for right now, just know this question, question number 882, was about cardiac tamponade, okay? And that needs a long needle under guided ultrasound or a pericardial window to open that up and get that fluid out. All right. Yeah, Mandy says, no playing around. That's right. What do we say? Go big or go home, right? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, your normal trauma 14 gauge IVs are not uh, deep enough about two thirds of the time. And they learned this from stuff um, from research and case studies from downrange. Uh, our combat medics uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, and Operation Iraqi Freedom, when they had to do a lot more of the um, immediate care for these guys, that they just, and that's not a healthy person with normal body tissue. So obviously, someone who's obese or overweight or bigger t has more tissue. You know your normal trauma 14 gauge that's usually an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter is not going to be deep enough. All right, spinal needle, yeah, it's long enough, but it's not the right diameter. Okay, Terry, that's awesome. You did your ruck Memorial Day, awesome. 
Yeah, I did my workouts this weekend as well, too. Hey, so here you guys go. Speaking of combat medics, if you guys know, this is the uh, T-shirt uh, basically depicting the combat medic memorial at Fort Sam Houston. I've actually trained and taught there twice. Um, I've got a lot of contacts in that community, the 68 Whiskeys. Uh, if you guys are part of that community or friends with them, feel free to drop a comment. Uh, the brotherhood still lives. We look out for one another. Um, and, uh, of course, this is something we teach them quite regularly as far as these immediate uh, primary threat things like the needle decompression, the pericardiocentesis, etc. Yeah, Karen, so, you know, this needle has made it through for five years TSA. I have no idea why. I mean, like what? Like I couldn't, like, you know, take out a pilot with this, right? Um, I get, maybe it has something to do with the, um, the sharps container that comes in. Maybe it's radio opaque. I don't know. I've never had an issue with it. And you know what? If they said something, I would show them my, my paramedic card, my nurse practitioner card, my nursing license, and say, hey, I'm a medical professional. This is in case of life or death emergency. Never had that issue, though. Hasn't been a problem. So I will continue to carry it until they take it away from me because you never know. It can make the difference, right? Interesting. All right, guys. Hey, I got to get back to some other stuff. I just want to share that with you. So practice question 882 is about cardiac tamponade. It's on the Facebook page. Another question coming at you a little bit later tonight and then a, a discussion with it as well tomorrow. All right. Um, I'll post a video in a few minutes here from this uh, session. If you got any other questions or feedback or comments, just let me know. I'm here for you guys, especially you guys looking for your CEN exam. Um, I'm here for y'all. Oh, and quick little plug. So I've, I've only got about five or six people sign up for the online class next week, uh, June 3rd and 4th. So if you want in on that, I need you to register ASAP because I have to mail you the book and the handouts by priority mail so you have it in time for the class. So if you're interested in that, uh, give that a whirl. Look at my uh, website, passthecen.com, and I will let you guys go. Have a good evening. Talk to you guys later. Y'all stay safe. Love y'all. Bye.